All right. Thank you, Arliss. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship at Grace United Methodist Church. So glad that you're here today to celebrate the love of our Lord Jesus Christ and to recognize that we belong to him. Above and beyond anything else, we belong to him. I um, want to draw your attention to a couple of things. There's a, an attendance sheet in your bulletin. Please fill that out and drop that in one of the baskets at the back as you leave today. We would appreciate the, just the fact of knowing that you are here. Um, I, want to, I want to mention a couple of things. The, uh, the two tables that we have for the New Life Pregnancy Center banquet are filled. Uh, the one for God Shelter of Love has two. They're gone. Two slots. Never mind. They're all gone. Well, there we go. We filled them all up. I was kind of like an auctioneer looking out here, getting the nod, you know, of what was, what was actually happening. Okay, so those filled up this morning. And so... Um, too bad, so sad. What else can I say? I don't know. <laughs> next year, next year, or you can probably call those organizations and still, they'd still find room for you. Also, uh, you have been very wonderful in your, in your support of our attempt to support law enforcement, and we are grateful for that. Uh, we're grateful for the gifts that have come in. We are still short a few gifts. We need those by next Sunday. There are sign-up sheets right out there next to the box, and um, hope that you'll, that you'll sign up to bring those. There is a wonderful insert in your bulletin that explains it all and does a very thorough job of it, explains what, what they're for, uh, explains um, um, how to use these thank you cards that are inserted here. Whoops, There's a, there are some cards in here for you to use. You can... If you would do that before you leave the sanctuary today, even if you did one last week, if you would do another, that would be wonderful. Put them in the basket, which is by the pillar uh, to the left of the center doors back at the back there. Um, just drop, drop those in there. Um, and there's some scripture that's indicated there that you can use if you'd like. You can sign them if you want to. You don't have to sign them if you don't want to. That's okay too. But we're attempting to make sure that, uh, that um, the, the Macon County Sheriff's Department and the Decatur Police Department know that we are supporting them um, in some really challenging times. So uh, appreciate your help with that. Uh, also, there's a greeter and usher breakfast on Saturday, October 2nd. If you're interested in participating in that or just want to come and check it out, um, sign up. We'd love to have you come and be part of that. All right, would you find a way to greet those around you, whatever way you're comfortable with, if you want to wave, if you want to stand up and shake, whatever you want to do, uh, bump elbows, and then uh, the choir will lead us in the intro in just a, just a minute.
If you'll stand, I'm going to give you a few instructions before we do this call to worship, but if you'll stand, if you're able, we're uh, going to be using a little portion of, of Psalm 118, verses tw- uh, 14 through 29, and interspersed in there is a little chorus, and um, if, you, if you're following the slides, it'll show up on the slides. If you want to use your hymnal, it's number 839. And wherever there's a little red R, that's where the response is done. And we're going to be using response number two. Now, you don't know response number two any better than I know response number two. But we've taken care of that because the choir is going to lead response number two first. And then we'll join in. And then we'll do the call to worship as we typically do uh, responsively. And uh, then we'll sing that little ditty in there three other times. Okay? Okay. Is it all clear as mud? All right, clear as mud. Let's go for it. Now join, join in. This is the day. is my strength and my power. The Lord has become my salvation. The Lord's joyous joyous songs are victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sorely, but has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice, let us rejoice. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, he who has given us light. Lead the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, who is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever. This is the day.
about three more times through that, and some of you would be ready to do solos on that, wouldn't you? <laughs> We're going to uh, join together in uh, a medley of songs, Majesty, Worship His Majesty, His Name is Wonderful, and He is Lord, as we praise the Lord together. can be seated. Can you tell this, this service is focused on Jesus Christ? Just the way it should be. Just the way it should be. We, uh, we want to take a couple of minutes uh, this morning and um, as we do each September and uh, recognize the United Methodist Women organization and their contributions to the work of Christ in our world. The United Methodist Women exist for three purposes. One is to know God and to experience freedom as whole persons through Jesus Christ. The second is to develop a creative, supportive fellowship. And third is to expand concepts of mission through participation in the global ministries of the church. Our organization here um, emphasizes that, that third part, part uh, very specifically to participate in the global ministries of the church through, through missions. And um, we participate at a local level, we participate at, as part of the Sangamon River District, and we participate as part of the Illinois Great Rivers Conference. Uh, Bev Stern is the president, Bonnie Dixon is the vice president, Mildred Dilley is the secretary, and Alice Wiedrich is the treasurer of that organization. 
I think you already know this, but every year as part of their celebration of missions, they make a, a special recognition to a woman in the church who has made a contribution to uh, the life of Grace United Methodist Church. And so today, the United Methodist women um, are recognizing Anne Irwin for, with a special mission recognition. I'm just trying to see, is there somebody, uh, Anne, come on down if you would. Uh, where's, where's, and Billy's here too. We're gonna, just, we're gonna just plop you right here in the middle while we say a couple of things about you if you don't care. And Billy's here with you? Okay. Billy, do you feel left out? Do you wanna come up here? You're okay, all right, all right. Just wanted to check. So, lots of people know Anne just because of the wonderful warm smile you receive as she's part of the Greeters Corps as, as people come into the, into the um, worship services on Sunday morning. But probably more of you know her because of her leadership in Operation Enduring Support, um, which she has led since 20... 20 <laughs> yeah, let's see that smile. There we go. Uh, she has led Operation Enduring Support since 2013, I believe that's right. Isn't it right? Okay. And... Um, and if you don't know about Operation Enduring Support, then you've been, you've been uh, living away in a monastery somewhere or something. Because Operation Enduring Support is one of the means that we have as a congregation of supporting those who are protecting us in the military. And we do that through providing, um, through providing uh, gift boxes essentially at Christmas time and at Easter. And those go out worldwide to a number of those that are serving in the military. And um, those not only send, not only are the goodies included, but there's always a witness to the love of Christ sent with those. And that's really important to us as a congregation to make sure that we do that, as sending devotional material. And um, Anne is also a regular part of Pete and Julie Paulson's Sunday school class. And she is also part of the Wednesday Morning Sisters in Christ Bible study group. Um, and that tells us something about her, just the fact that her faith is important to her. The other, other two things that she's really interested in are intertwined, and that is that she has a very strong interest in genealogy. And uh, that she's been recognized at, at a local level and at a state level with uh, leadership positions in genealogical uh, groups. And particularly, the second part is that's intertwined with that is She's also a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution, and that also combines with the genealogy, so it all comes together, all, all fits together. Those of you who know Anne know that she is a, a humble and an unassuming person. And um, I just want to say, don't be fooled by that to think that she can't lead because this woman, this woman can, can lead. She knows how to get things done. She's an organizer of people in order to complete tasks and does that very, very well. That would be enough for some, but, but for Anne, that's just, uh, well, we gotta put the foundation under, you know, we build all, the, build all that, now we gotta put the foundation, and the foundation underneath that is that she has a strong, committed relationship with Jesus Christ. And that relationship with Christ really drives what she does because she sees her, her work not just for temporal, meeting temporal needs, but having an, in, uh, an eternal impact as well. And uh, so we uh, sure, surely want to recognize that. And um, so Anne, of course I left it up on the upper deck. Uh, we, have, we have a pin that we'd like to give you. And we have a, a certificate that we would like to give to you. And um, then there is a gift that has been sent to the National Organization of the United Methodist Women in your name to honor you uh, for this, for this day. And so we give thanks to God for you. We're gonna pray for you right now. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this wonderful woman who is is not only growing in her faith, but growing in her understanding of how to express that faith through acts of service and kindness to others. Lord, would you please continue to, to bless Anne 
We know that, know that along the way you have been faithful and good to her in so many ways in her life. And um, we thank you that for, for an expression of that through the way that she cares for others and the, and the service that she renders on behalf of Christ. Lord, build her up, continue to use her in wonderful and marvelous ways for, for, the sake of, for the sake of Jesus and for the good of this church and for the good of those to whom she gives witness uh, of, her, of her own abiding faith. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Now we need to give thanks in a really warm way for Anne Irwin. Thank you. All right, I'm, I'm, I, I told my wonderful wife I've got, I've got too many pieces of paper I'm trying to keep track of, and so if I forget something, just holler at me or something, okay? We're going to the prayer time, I believe, and um, the prayer time, as we usually do it, is going to be responsive. I do want to let you know as a congregation that, um, that we have lost Rosemary Bradford. She has gone to be with the Lord, and um, her service will be not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow, on Monday the 27th at 10 o'clock here in the sanctuary. So be praying for uh, Rosemary Bradford, um, and yeah, Rhonda Allen in particular, who's her niece, if you don't, didn't know that connection, Rhonda Allen is her niece, so, so, so pray for that, pray for that family. I'll invite you, if you'd like to join us at the rail, you're welcome to do that, and then we'll pray in just a minute. Almighty God, through Jesus Christ, you taught us to pray. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that our prayers may serve your purposes and show your steadfast love to others. Keep us centered in your will and way all our days. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending us our Savior, Jesus Christ, who broke down the walls of hostility that divide us and reconciled us to you. Help us build on him as the chief cornerstone of our life together. Holy God, whom to love also means to love our neighbors, break down the divisions that separate us from one another. Remove hatred, prejudice, and bitterness from us and others so that we may live together in your peace. Merciful God, stand with those who are in sorrow or bear the pain of this world. May they be sure that neither life nor death, nor things present nor things to come shall separate them from your love in Christ Jesus. Provide strength for each day and bright hope for tomorrow. God of compassion, bless those whom we love, our families and friends, so that drawing close to you, we may be drawn closer to each other. May we be joined together into a holy temple for your glory by the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. Grace-filled God, whose word we trust, whose spirit works in and through us, hear our prayers this day and further those that will bring about your purposes on the earth. We pray through Jesus Christ, the one who rules over all things. And now we pray the prayer he so graciously taught his followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. time of offering ourselves to the Lord, we're using 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, which will be up on the screen. 
As you come to him, the living stone rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Do you hear the building project going on there? It's God building a house, and each one who is a follower of Jesus is part of the, one of the stones that makes that up. But we're, we're grounded, we're, we're centered on the cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ himself. And, um, and so as we, as we look at Christ, we seek to see him in the same way his father does. Did you, did you hear that in, in there? His, Jesus is precious to his father. And Jesus is precious to us. And as his Holy Spirit works in us, we, we then become a place where spiritual offerings can be given to God, offered to him. May this be a time of offering yourself to the Lord and making him uh, one that is declared precious in your sight as well. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the gift of Christ, the cornerstone of the life that we have. And as we are being built up into that spiritual house, Lord, may Grace United Methodist Church be known as a place where, it, it, where offerings are given of time and talent and treasure, of, of energy and, and vitality, of thought, in ways that are uplifting and in ways that, that matter for eternal purposes. Thank you for the opportunity in this moment to give ourselves again to you. We do that without reserve. We do that willingly. We do that freely. We do that gladly in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is My Hope is Built. It's 368 in your hymnal. If you want to use that or it'll be on the screen, would you please stand as we prepare to hear the word of the Lord.
Jesus taught that, didn't he? That his words become the foundation in the midst of the storms of life. And so we'll hear from God's word from Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, And for his name's sake, we received grace and apostleship to call people from among the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Good morning, friends. For those of you who have been reading the soapy text over the course of this last week, we'll get to that text. We didn't read it this morning yet, but we will get to that Ephesians passage you've been reading this week. Will you bow with me for a moment of prayer? Let not your word, O Lord, become a judgment upon us that we hear it and do not respond to it. Send your Holy Spirit in these moments, Father, that hearing we may understand, and understanding, we may say yes to the life you call us to in Jesus within the community of faith. In his precious name we pray, amen. So we are in the second week of a sermon series we've entitled A Called Community. Last week, Sig preached on Psalm 96, reminding us that we are a community that is called to worship. God made us for worship, but we choose to whom or to what we give that worship. As followers of Jesus, our worship, our worship of him and him alone is the cornerstone of our relationship with God. That's what Sig talked about last week. Upon our worship, we build our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that exalts Jesus as Lord and then humbles us to live in obedience to his will and to his way. Today, we're talking about another cornerstone. So worship is the cornerstone of our relationship with Jesus. And as that is true, Jesus is the cornerstone of our, of his church, of our community with one another. Jesus is the cornerstone of his church. As we worship the one true God, What he's doing is he is building us together as a community into a place where he himself dwells with us and through us then reaches the world. Together, as one in him, we belong to Jesus. My heart always delights in those building images that we find throughout the scripture And the reason for that is because my dad made his living for a couple of decades as a builder with my grandfather, my mom's dad. And back in the day when I was growing up and in my teen years particularly, I like to say as I drove around the community with my friends, my dad and my grandpa built half the town of Morton. (laughs) Now, that was not actual fact, even back then, but my spirit always swelled with pride in my parentage because it was as though they owned half the town because they had built so many of the homes there. Well, in, this, in a similar kind of way, we belong to Jesus in the first place by his right of ownership as our creator. That's your first point on your outline. We belong to Jesus by his right of ownership as our creator. And he doesn't sell us as dad sold his houses. (laughs) Read Psalm 24 verse one with me, you'll find it on the screen. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, 
the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Everything and everyone on all the earth belongs to God because he made it. He made it all. God owns it all. Romans 14, 8 says this, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Do you get that? Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Those who walk around heedless of their relationship with God and those who worship Jesus as Lord and as King, all of us belong to God because he made everyone and everything. He has the right of ownership. Now, there may be some who are hearing my voice today, either here in the room or in your own living rooms, who are thinking you are your own boss. Isn't that kind of just our nature? I'm the boss of me. I remember when my brother would tell me something to do. He was my younger brother, by the way. I would say, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> ever, ever been there? <laughs> We like to think of ourselves as independent and self-sufficient, doing life my way and making my own way and owning my own stuff and controlling my own agenda. But the reality, the pure, unadulterated fact is this. We all belong to God. He's the boss of me. He's the boss of you and you and you whether we acknowledge him as such or not. He made you, he made me, and he has the right of ownership over each of us. Now, if that was the end of the story, God's the boss, he's the owner, whether I like it or not, I'm his and that's that, well, that would be a really sad story. But that's not the end of the story. God sends out this call all across the earth to any who will hear and respond. In Romans 1, 6, we just read, Sig just read for us, and you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Everyone belongs to God by God's right of ownership, but only those who respond to his invitation by faith in Jesus are being built into this home where God dwells with us on this earth. It's an invitation that requires a response. So the second point on your outline is, we belong to Jesus by our response to his invitation. We belong to Jesus by our response to his invitation. We're going to read now Ephesians 2, 14 to 22. And what this text helps us understand is a little bit more about that invitation as the community that he's building into his dwelling place. Hear the word of the Lord. For Jesus himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Now, why don't you read these last couple of verses with me? In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So the invitation to belong to Jesus 
is an invitation, first of all, to peace. Peace with God and peace with one another. It's an invitation to peace with God and with one another. Paul was writing in this Ephesians passage to Jewish believers in Jesus and to Gentile believers. They tended to squabble with one another in the first century church. Jewish believers grew up in this tradition of worship that divided Jew from Gentile. Gentiles could be seen around the temple area because there were some of them who were, who were not Jews but nevertheless feared God. We've talked about them here before as God-fearers who went to the temple to worship the one true God. But Jews thought of them as aliens and foreigners, and they were separated from the place of sacrifice and from the Jewish worshipers by a dividing wall that was called the machitza, the machitza. I put it up there so you'd go, what is she saying? Machitza. Just like the veil in the temple's most holy place, remember when Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the most holy place was torn in two, providing us with access to God? Well, that access was provided to both Jew and Gentile. Every person on earth who would respond to the invitation to belong to Jesus by faith in him now has access to God, the most holy place. The veil is torn apart and the dividing wall, the machitza, has been torn down in Christ. So the invitation to belong to Jesus is an invitation to become citizens together in a different kingdom, the kingdom of God. Yes, we're citizens of this world, and some of us are very proud of our citizenship in the United States of America, and that's good and right, but we have an even higher and more enduring allegiance to the eternal kingdom in which we already live right here and right now. We are actually foreigners and aliens on this earth. We're just passing through. This isn't home. When we belong to Jesus, we belong to his kingdom. And we live under his rule even right now while we live on this earth. Our choices Our attitudes, our words, our actions all reflect in this world the values and the priorities and the reality of the kingdom of God in our midst. As citizens of his kingdom, we are protected by his power and we're guarded by his, as his very own for all eternity. We're under his authority and we're obligated to obey his law of love in the midst of this ever-darkening world. So the invitation to belong to Jesus is an invitation to become citizens of a different kingdom, of his kingdom, but it's also an invitation to become members of God's household, children of God, adopted into his family by faith in Jesus. We're children of God, adopted into his family. He's our king and he is our father. We are brothers and sisters, not only because we are human beings and not only by birth into particular families, but you and I are brothers and sisters by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about that. I think that might be next week's message. We belong to one another. Finally, the invitation to belong to Jesus is an invitation to become together one building whose cornerstone is Jesus and whose foundation is the truth that we find in the scriptures. The cornerstone is Jesus and the foundation is the scripture. Jesus, the cornerstone, joins us all together and makes the church strong and stable as a holy dwelling place for God. Jesus is the one who connects us. We have to keep Jesus at the very heart and center in order for us to live as the community of faith. 
Our foundation in this building called the church is the truth of the scriptures as taught by the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament who all, all of them, the whole scripture points us to Jesus. There is no other foundation. If any who claim the name of Jesus are building the church on any other foundation than the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they are not building the church. They are building something else altogether. But if we are building on that foundation, then the dividing walls of hostility have been torn down. And Jesus invites us to be united and bound together across races, denominations, and social locations into one dwelling place for God. To belong to Jesus is to respond to his invitation to peace with God and peace with one another in our local churches and in the universal church. It is to respond to life in his kingdom with Jesus as king and in his family as our, having God as our father and Jesus as our brother, trusting and obeying his word and his spirit who gives us access to the one father. Hear me, friends, to respond to the invitation to belong to Jesus is to live in peace with one another in the church, not tearing one another down, not gossiping, not building up dividing walls, those have been torn down, but loving one another for the sake of Jesus. We are a community called to belong to Jesus. First, by his right of ownership, second, by our response to his invitation, and finally, on your outline, by marriage. This may catch you off guard a bit. We belong to Jesus by marriage. Romans 7, 4 says this. So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong. And in some of our translations that reads that you might be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit to God. Now one of the squabbles in the early Christian community was over obedience to the law. They squabbled about circumcision and dietary laws and purity laws. In Romans chapter seven, Paul gives the example of marriage to illustrate that we have died to the law when we were made alive in Christ. He writes in verse two, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. In other words, she's free to marry another man when her husband dies. Now before Jesus, gotta follow Paul's logic here, before Jesus, it was as though we were married to the law. It ruled over us. We belonged to it. It had hold of us. We were slaves to the sin in which we all lived. And the law demanded our death. We're married to the law. If we sin, it demands our death. At the cross, Jesus died our death and so set us free from the penalty of the law and the power of sin over us. He set us free so that we could be bound to him in marriage. Jesus dwelling in us in an intimate relationship by his Holy Spirit. Now remember, we're talking about the whole community of faith. The law brings fruit that leads to death, Paul writes. In other words, we cannot keep the law on our own because we're sinners, and so we're going to sin. We're going to transgress the law. Therefore, as we live out our days, we sin against God and against his law, 
and the penalty for such sin is death according to the law. But in Christ, he put to death the law. It can no longer hold us. It no longer has power over us. Sin no longer binds us. We are free to accept Jesus' proposal of marriage so that in Christ, together as the community of Jesus, we bear fruit that leads to life, that exalts and magnifies our God. We, the church, the community of Christ, are enabled by his spirit in us, married to us, to live as his holy people right now in the community that he is building as his own dwelling place and for all eternity as his redeemed and restored bride. As a community, we belong to Jesus in marriage. Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, why don't you read this text with me? Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Let me read that last line for you again because we stumbled a bit. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Wow, what a marvelous husband Jesus is. Do you understand? We are his bride in whom Jesus is at work purifying us for himself, purging us of sin, and making us holy as he is holy. He does all of that as the husband of his bride, the church. Then we bear in this body, the church, the fruits of his Holy Spirit, so that others may see what life in Christ looks like and they might hear the invitation to belong to Jesus. Remember, he sends that invitation out to any who will hear and respond. And as we, the body of Christ, live in that marriage relationship with Jesus, we're the ones now through whom he sends that message out and they recognize life in Christ when they look at us and how we live together as his bride. Our culture, friends, has no idea, no idea what the purpose or meaning of marriage is in the mind and heart of our creator. No idea. And even in the church, we have so diluted and diminished and misunderstood and dismantled the meaning of marriage, the beautiful scriptural meaning of marriage, so that it is no longer capable of serving its intended function in society. Did you hear that intended function? Even in our marriage relationships with one another is to reflect in this community around the world <laughs> the love of Jesus for his church and the relationship that we have with him as the bride of Christ. Paul continues in Ephesians 5, 31 and 32, quoting Genesis. Why don't you read this with me? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery but I am talking about Christ and the church. Marriage as God designed it to be provides an environment in which we learn and grow to be more like Jesus. Now, it isn't what the culture thinks and it isn't what many of us think. Simply for our satisfaction to make us happy, but it is for our transformation into Christ-likeness. 
marriage that has Christ at the center between a man and a woman provides a witness to the world of the kind of relationship that Jesus invites his church to enjoy with him. We belong to Jesus in marriage, a relationship of purity, mutual love, support, confidence, trust, concern, honor, peace, and yes, indeed, delight. We are his, and he is ours, and he calls us to live together in community in such a way that by our relationships with one another and with him, we exalt his name in this world because he alone is worthy of all honor and glory and praise. Oh, I'm running over, and I wanted so much to um, kind of run through a hymn here, but <clears throat> let me just wrap the message up. We are a called community. We are called to belong to Jesus, not simply as those he owns, but he does, because he made us, but as those who live in intimate, everlasting relationship of love and delight with our Creator. It's an invitation that demands a response. There's a proposal on the table. Our God is the most worthy suitor who will ever make this proposal to you. And you can say no, but I can't imagine why you would since we already belong to God because he made us, why not accept his invitation, his proposal to enter into an intimate relationship of peace with him by faith in Jesus that will heal us of our brokenness and our divisions, that will bring us out of our darkness, set us free from sin and death, establish us in his kingdom, and eventually, open up into a glorious eternity when Christ returns, where we will be face to face together with him. We are gonna conclude this message today with um, a, a new song. And I know some of you don't really care about learning new songs, but this is a really good one, and the choir is really going to help us and you only have a little part, so it'll be okay. I bet you can pick up on it. And as you make, you, so they're singing the vast majority of the song, and you're making little responses. The, and the first one reminds us of the marriage covenant. The response is, we do, over and over, we do. And the next response is, it is. And then the next response is, he does, and he is. Those are, the, those are just two little words you sing throughout this, this um, hymn. So as you make those responses, keep in mind his invitation to you. Pay attention to what the choir is singing so that when you make your response, you can sing it like you mean it. The title of the song is, Is He Worthy? And I hope right now you can all just declare he is. Is he worthy? Amen.
is worthy. Let the Lord have some praise. He is worthy. He is worthy of all glory and blessing and honor and praise. Praise the Lord. Praise him alone. We belong to Jesus. We are called to belong to Jesus. So friends, accept the invitation. It's a marriage proposal. And we live together as the bride of Christ. He tears down every dividing wall. Don't let sin separate us from one another because it has no power over us anymore. But let us live in love and peace with one another as we declare every time we share in Holy Communion with each other. The invitation there is that those who seek to live in love and peace with one another are invited to his table. It's the same here today, to belong to Jesus. It's an invitation to live in love and peace with one another and with our God and then to reflect the life of Christ out in this world as we live together. Oh, blessed friends and brothers and sisters in Christ, let us reflect the glory of the Lord in this world and show the world he is worthy. Amen? Amen. Amen.